the Johnson Wax Program, Words at War with Clifton Fadiman. Makers of Johnson's Wax for Home and Industry, in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime, again bring you Words at War, another dramatization based upon one of the significant books to come out of this great world conflict. And here with us, as usual, to introduce our program is one of the keenest judges of good books in America, Clifton Fadiman. Fadiman. Good evening. When do you think we will defeat Japan? Allied leaders are divided on that question. Estimates range all the way from one to three years. Everyone has his own idea. But one distinguished war correspondent, a man who spent a year in the Pacific, has a very definite idea and has written a thought-provoking book about it. I'll tell you more about the book and its author after a word from Jack Costello. Friends, during a month that's as exciting and significant as this October, it's hard to put our minds to the simple everyday tasks of life, such as housekeeping. And yet our homes were never more important than right now and during the next several years. We want as much beauty in them as we can have. But that beauty doesn't depend upon having expensive things. Modest furnishings can have that rich, wax-polished look if they're regularly protected with Johnson's Wax. When floors, furniture, and woodwork gleam with wax beauty, the entire home takes on a different look. And Johnson's Wax has many extra uses in your home for protecting window sills, lampshades, leather articles, ornaments, Venetian blinds. The list is almost endless. And each one is another chance to save yourself work because wax things clean so easily. The coat of Johnson's Wax, though invisible, acts like a shield to keep dirt from penetrating the surface. The wax itself takes the wear. The surface underneath is safe. Mr. Fadiman? Although the war in Europe is far from won, Americans are becoming increasingly conscious of that other war we have to win, the war in the Pacific. Tonight's book directs our attention to that war. It's called Pacific Victory 1945. It was written by the New York Herald Tribune's world-roving correspondent, Joseph Driscoll. Driscoll himself is now with the advanced forces of General Patton's army somewhere in Germany. But before he went to Europe, he spent a year in the Pacific Theater, living with the officers and men who were fighting the Japs. What he saw there led him to put the title of Pacific Victory 1945 on the story he had to tell. This is Driscoll's story. We can beat Japan in 1945 if... Yes, naturally, there are ifs. If we beat Germany in 1944, we can beat Japan in 1945 if... If there is no slackening of the war effort anywhere along the line. If the home front does its job as well as the fighting front. If... Well, wait a minute. Let's meet a few of the reasons why I think we can look for Pacific victory 1945. Let's meet McNimsey. McNimsey is not one person, but three, as you shall see. One day in December 1941, a blue-eyed, ruddy-faced, silver-haired, medium-tall man entered the club car of a transcontinental train. A companion followed him, and as they walked through the car, one of the passengers jumped to his feet. Well, well, good God. Imagine seeing you here. How are you? I'm sorry. I think you've made a mistake. Oh, no. Why, you must remember me. Professor Roberts, we had a great chat the night you addressed the college president. Uh, my, uh, my name is Wainwright. No, no. <laughs> How is everything? I am everything? very sorry, sir. You have me confused with somebody else. Uh, my name is Wainwright. You'll excuse me, please. Wainwright? Oh. Oh. Oh, certainly, Mr. Wainwright. <clears throat> Forgive me. Not at all. Johnson, shall we go back to the compartment? Of course. I'm very sorry, Mr. Wainwright. 
Did he really know you, sir? Yes, of course he did. I guess we'd better stay out of the club car. Yes, it wouldn't do for the word to get around to this stage of the game. No, oh, he'll keep his mouth shut. He caught on. Well, shall we have a look at these papers? Yes, sir. Uh, by the way, sir, that's an odd-looking bag for you to be carrying those precious documents in. <laughs> so all I could find we left in such a hurry. My wife's sewing bag. <laughs> Still clutching his wife's sewing bag, Mr. Wainwright and his companion arrived in Los Angeles. Your car, Mr. Wainwright. Oh, yes, thank you. Hop in, Johnson. Yes, sir. They went on to San Diego. Mr. Wainwright. Yeah? The plane is ready, sir. Thank you. Let's go, Johnson. They flew on through the day and night when their plane landed, there was no longer any reason for remaining incognito. As Mr. Wainwright stepped off the plane, Navy men snapped to attention. Mr. Wainwright, better known as Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, one-third of McNimsey, had arrived at Pearl Harbor to take over as Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific. Americans ought to know this man who set out from Washington in December 1941 as Mr. Wainwright and took over at Pearl Harbor as four-star Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, able administrator, stern disciplinarian, good fighting man, good family man, a man who walks to headquarters with a little schnauzer dog tangling along behind him, and dedicates each waking hour to the task of killing Japs. He doesn't like killing anything. He wouldn't kill a fly in peacetime, but he thinks that the killing of Japs is his particular business now, because he wants to see as few Americans killed as possible. Yes, that's Chester W. Nimitz, one-third of McNimsey. One reason to hope for Pacific victory, 1945. Now, listen to this. Hirohito, your time is short. Admiral Yamamoto, you will be present at a dictated peace in the White House, but it won't be as you envisaged. Tojo, when you unleash the attack on Pearl Harbor, you started something which will make you wish you died when you were a baby. Who's that talking? Another member of the firm of McNimsey. One of the toughest fighting men the world ever saw. Selected by Admiral Nimitz to command the attack in the South Pacific. And having assumed command, he said this to the soldiers and sailors and Marines fighting under him. Gentlemen, we are the South Pacific Fighting Force. I don't want anybody to be even thinking in terms of Army, Navy, and Marines. Every man must understand it. If I have to take off all uniforms, issue coveralls, and imprint the insignia South Pacific Fighting Force on the seat of the pants. The men got the idea. The men from captain to ship's cook, from general to private, got the idea. And as the fighting progressed in those rugged early days of the war, their respect and confidence in their leader grew day by day. Maybe it was because... You know, I figure this way. If he can take it, so can I. Yeah, me too. Say, did you hear what happened today? No, what? Well, you know Butch, the cook? Sure. Well, after dinner, the old man calls him over and says... Butch, I want you to know that's the best meal I've eaten for a long time. Yeah? Well, Butch gets so flustered, he says to the old man, Oh, horse feathers, sir. <laughs> <laughs> What'd the old man do? Just about bust his sides out laughing. <laughs> he's for me. Yep, me too. I just hope he knows what he's doing, the old man. Of a... Yes, sir. I resent being called old. Yes, sir. Hey, who was that? Holy catch, that was him. That was the old man. <laughs> It happened just that way. The old man never got too busy to enjoy a laugh on himself. Even during the bitter days of Guadalcanal when he first took over. Even in the days when he stopped the southward march of the Japs toward Australia and New Zealand. Yes, he has a ready laugh. But the smiling lines of his mouth vanish into gritted teeth when he faces our enemy in the Pacific. Then he looks as tough as a bulldog. Then he's the daring, ruthless partner in the firm of McNimsey. The name... Admiral William S. Halsey. (laughs) 
I met the last partner of McNimsey face to face for the first time in Brisbane. I talked about him with my fellow correspondents hundreds of times. Because he's a man that you just naturally talk about. He's a, an actor. Yeah. Yes, he is, and a good one. He's strictly army. I know. Perhaps, as an army man should be. You know, I asked him if Japan could be defeated by bombing and blockade alone. Yeah. He said absolutely no. <laughs> the strongest element in Japan, he said, is her army, which must be defeated before our success is assured. Yeah. This can only be done by the ground forces. He said it's useless and misleading to think of shortcuts. They do not exist, he said. Yeah. But he designs his own caps. <laughs> so I hear. And he admits it. His communiques. Oh, <laughs> gosh. They're literal. Yeah, I know. Yes, his communiques are famous. He has a flair for the poetic. You know, he looks 20 years younger than he is. He sure does. All of that. He's hard to get to for an interview, yeah, you know. So right. Well, the men swear by him. I'll say so. They've seen him take the same chances as the merest buck private. He gets airsick when he flies. Huh? <laughs> yes, he does. But he flies when flying will do the job. And didn't you ever hear of a seasick admiral? Thinks he can win with just an air force and land forces. Maybe. And perhaps he can. He's sworn that he'll retake the Philippines. Wouldn't do it. I think he will. I know he will. He hasn't had too much to work with. You said it. No. Nazi Germany was number one on our list. I heard a story about him today. Huh? <laughs> Seems he got a, an orderly from down south. Yeah. The orderly came in one day and said, Sir, what hat do you want me to bash down today? <laughs> a bash down army cap looks pretty rakish. But the story's probably manufactured. Just like the story that he has orange juice and three communiques for breakfast. Mr. Driscoll. Uh, yes. The general will see you now. Will you come with me? Thank you. This was in Brisbane. I had heard the legends, but this was the first time I had met him face to face. He was all I'd expected. Dramatic? Yes. He strode forward and shook my hand vigorously. Then he sat on a window seat and talked, punctuating his remarks with a thrust of his long-stemmed briar pipe. He's good to look at. He looks like what Hollywood would conceive him to be in casting a picture... His eyes are clear and sharp. He's immaculately dressed. I listen. I can't tell you what he said, but I can tell you what it adds up to. He hates Japs. General Douglas MacArthur hates Japs and won't rest until he has done his share to defeat them. So that's McNimsey, a word I coined in one of my dispatches to sum up the leadership of our war in the Pacific. MacArthur, Nimitz, and Halsey. McNimsey. They run the show in the Pacific. Their commands are thousands of miles apart, but they are united by a common purpose. Shall we call it victory? Well, they're more realistic. They call their job the job of killing Japs. That's right, killing Japs. You coin your house finding phrases if you want to. But these are fighting men. MacArthur, Nimitz, and Halsey. They say we'll kill Japs. MacArthur, Nimitz, and Halsey. McNimsey. Prime reason why I call my story Pacific Victory, 1945. This is Clifton Fatterman. Tonight on the Johnson Wax program, Words at War, we're bringing you a dramatization based upon Joseph Driscoll's book, Pacific Victory, 1945. So far, Mr. Driscoll has introduced us to the firm of McNimsey, composed of Admiral Nimitz, Admiral Halsey, and General MacArthur. Their leadership in the Pacific, according to our author, is one reason to hope for victory over the Japanese in 1945. We continue now with Joseph Driscoll and Pacific Victory, 1945. We've met the leaders. Now let's meet the men. A Marine told a sailor on Guadalcanal 
the army is coming just think of it pal the sailor he answered well all right then let's build a nice clubhouse for our fighting men what men i can't begin to tell you what kind of men we have out there kids most of them kids with a god-given sense of humor they can have entertainments and maybe a play recreation advisors from the WPA USO host says yee and sweet nurses galore for the army gives morale a very high score We've got the leadership to win in the Pacific and we've got the men. Marines, soldiers, sailors, Seabees, all fighting for America. Griping about it, sure, but doing the job. Did I say griping? Oh, oh how they gripe. Marines against sailors, sailors against soldiers, soldiers against flyers. And especially those long-suffering members of the Air Force who are tied to jobs on the ground. Here we go into the file case yonder diving deep into the drawer here it is buried away down under the gosh darn stuff we've been searching for off we go into the CEO's office where we get one heck of a roar we live in miles of paper files but nothing will stop the army chair car how do they do it? How do these American boys who live through hell every day in the Pacific manage to preserve a sense of humor? I lived with them, and I still don't know. I don't know how they can take what they've been taking for these years and still write their songs about each other, still kid each other. Do you ever stop to think who these boys are? They're kids just out of school. Kids who perhaps started to work on the first job of their lives. Insurance salesmen, clerks... Poor men's sons, rich men's sons. What are they doing out there? Dying. Being spattered, get the word, spattered to death by hand grenades. Being blown to bits by bombs, blown to bits, get that? Nothing left of them, not enough to bury. What did you do today, my friend, from morning until night? How many times did you complain that rationing is too tight? When are you going to start to do all of the things you say? A soldier would like to know, my friend, what did you do today? That's not a very good poem. You couldn't sell it for a nickel. The only reason I quote it here is because the author is a rather interesting American. He gave it to me. He was a little bit unsteady at the time. You see, he'd been wounded and had had to amputate his own right foot with a jackknife. A soldier would like to know, my friend, what did you do today? Will you come in, gentlemen? It was a press conference with a public relations officer. He had guests, some wounded men who had just returned from action at Macon Island. Right in here, gentlemen. We went in, and there were the wounded men from Macon. They were the lucky ones, just wounded. You could almost smell the gunpowder and blood. One of us asked a foolish question. Well, soldier, do you want to return to combat? The boy, and he was just a boy, looked up with tired eyes and said without fear or braggadocio, If I'm ordered to go, sir, I'll go. <laughs> What did you do today, my friend, to help us with the task? Did you work harder and longer for less, or is that too much to ask? What right have I to ask you this? I guess that's what you'll say. Maybe now you'll understand. You see, I died today. Not much of a poem. You couldn't sell it for a nickel. 
It's only interesting because the author, as I told you, wrote it after he had cut off his own foot with a jackknife. We've got the men. Men who would blush and stammer if you accuse them of being idealistic. Yet men who are fighting for you and me at home. That's no empty phrase. These men in the Pacific have kept the Japs out of our front yard. We've got the men and we've got the leadership. The firm of McNimsey, MacArthur, Nimitz, and Halsey. Men, leaders, and weapons. We've got them now. We've got the greatest fleet in world history assembled in the Pacific. A fleet that has risen from the ashes of Pearl Harbor. A fleet that spells the doom, I think, of Japan in 1945. Once I was a civvy, happy as could be, but along comes the draft board a looking after me. Greeting, said the letter, your country's needing you. If you haven't got a better spot, you know what we will do. So they sent me to Camp Allen, where I became a boot. They handed me a rifle, but the darn thing wouldn't shoot. That's all there is for now, we've really just begun. But you'll hear from us again before the war is won. A bum song, you couldn't sell it for a nickel. It's just a little thing one of the boys dashed off before the Japs sent a hundred screaming planes diving on them. I've called my story Pacific Victory, 1945. I didn't choose that title casually. I thought about it a great deal as I talked to the officers and men in the year I spent roving around the Pacific. I thought about it as I smacked mosquitoes, as I lay abed with fever, as I ate the eternal tinned meats you get when supplies run short. I looked at the men and at the leaders, McNimsey and company, Just consider what McNimsey and company have accomplished since December 7th, 1941, when the Japs made their sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. Consider what they have accomplished while we've been swinging a powerful right hand against Nazi Germany, leaving a comparatively feeble left to jab at the Japs. What's going to happen when we start slugging them with a big left and a big right, with the British fleet added to ours, and with a further likelihood that Russia will join in the attack once the bear has devoured the Nazi? But forget everything else but McNimsey and company. Give them everything they need, and I say it's still a good bet. If we beat Germany in 44, McNimsey and company to win in 45. Just one final word. I want you to stand with me on Guadalcanal Street. Guadalcanal Street is the name that has been given to the cemetery on that island in the Pacific. An island we never heard of before the war, but which now has buried hundreds of American boys who died for America. Walk along with me. Look at the inscriptions on the wooden markers. Dear brother, may you rest in peace. And may I never, until your death is avenged. Here's another. To the memory of a gunner whose life was taken at the completion of a mission we had volunteered to carry out. His memory will be retained by every member of his squadron. And this one. Here lies in glory an American flyer known only to God. There they lie, row on row, American boys who died. Please get that. They died. They gave the only real thing we have on earth. They gave their lives for you and me. As you hear this, 
I'm off on another front with General Patton and his advance forces in Germany. But at night, I think back to Guadalcanal Street, where the plain wooden markers stand row on row. Let's not forget those American boys. However soon or late we win in Europe, let's not let down. Let's make this our goal. Pacific Victory, 1945. Clifton Fadiman. Tonight, on the Johnson Wax program, Words at War, we brought you a dramatization based upon Joseph Driscoll's Pacific Victory, 1945. You'll recall Mr. Driscoll saying that he based the title of his book on several ifs, perhaps the most important being that we could win in the Pacific in 1945 if we won in Europe this year. However, the fortunes of modern war change swiftly. And now, according to Mr. Churchill and other allied leaders, it appears possible the Germans may hold out longer. However, I think if Mr. Driscoll were here with us tonight, he'd still say, and I think we'd agree, that Pacific Victory 1945 is a goal worth shooting at. With every ounce of energy we have, with everyone on the home front backing to the limit, our fighting men around the world. I'll be back after a word from Jack Costello. When people walk into your kitchen, what do you think they see first? Well, try it yourself in some other kitchen, and I think you'll agree it's the linoleum floor covering. It comes right up and hits you in the face, either because it's clean and sparkling with a rich polish or because it isn't. Of course, I'll always take my kitchen floors with a beautiful glow coat shine, the kind that's easy to maintain, the kind that offers solid protection against wear. Johnson's self-polishing glow coat keeps millions of floors beautiful, saves countless hours of work, because it needs no rubbing or buffing. You simply apply glow coat and let it dry. It polishes itself. It brings out the full colors and pattern of the linoleum, and it's a real economy because the regular use of glow coat makes linoleum last six to ten times longer. Need I say more than... Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. And now, Mr. Fadiman, what about next week's show? Next week? Well, next week at this hour, your old friends, Fibber McGee and Molly, return to the air after their summer vacation. And may we, of words at war, take this occasion to say that we've been happy and proud to present our program these 15 weeks under the sponsorship of the Johnson Wax Company. We're grateful for the interest of our listeners and the many letters you've written us. Speaking of letters... We've had a lot of inquiries about future Words at War programs. They'll continue to be heard on Tuesday nights over most of these stations two hours later at 11.30 Eastern War Time. Now, this is Clifton Fadiman inviting you to be on hand next week at this time for Fibber McGee and Molly and the Johnson Wax Program. Good night. <laughs> Tonight's dramatization of Pacific Victory 1945 by Joseph Driscoll was written by Gerald Holland and featured Bartlett Robinson as Joseph Driscoll. The music was composed by Tom Bennett and conducted by Milton Catons. Songs were sung by Tom Glazer. The production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. <laughs> Jack Costello speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>